Proverbs chapter 1 verse 8. Listen, my son, to your father's instruction and do not forsake your mother's teaching. They are a garland to grace your head and a chain to adorn your neck. My son, if sinful men entice you, do not give in to them. If they say, come along with us, let's lie in wait for innocent blood, let's ambush some harmless soul, let's swallow them alive like the grave and whole, like those who go down to the pit. We will get all sorts of valuable things and fill our houses with plunder. Cast lots with us. We will all share the loot. My son, do not go along with them. Do not set foot on their paths. For their feet rush into evil. They are swift to shed blood. How useless to spread a net where every bird can see it. These men lie in wait for their own blood. They ambush only themselves. Such are the paths of all who go after ill-gotten gain. It takes away the life of those who get it. Our second reading is just a little further on in Proverbs chapter 11, verse 24, and that is on page 1000 of the Bibles. Proverbs 11, 24. One person gives freely yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly but comes to poverty. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. People curse the one who hoards grain, but they pray God's blessing on the one who is willing to sell. Whoever seeks good finds favour, but evil comes to one who searches for it. Those who trust in their riches will fall, but the righteous will thrive like a green leaf. And the third reading for this morning, Proverbs chapter 19, verse 17, on page 1013. Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will reward them for what they have done. So let me ask you to begin with, what would you buy if you won $100 million in a Powerball jackpot draw? Uh, tricky if you don't have a ticket, but, you know, what would you do if you won $100 million? Would you buy a Land Rover Defender? Sorry, I'm preaching to myself here. Uh, would you buy a BMW M5? House on Beach Road, better still, in the Golden Mile? Maybe a villa in Tuscany? A first-class trip to Italy? Perhaps a house each for your children. How much would you give away? Would you set up a Ridley Scholarship Fund? Or would you pay for the vicarage renovation? Would you fund 10 missionaries? Where are you on the greed and generosity scale? Are you more greedy? or more generous. Sometimes difficult to admit, isn't it? And it's tricky to think about on a world scale because there's, there is so much inequality in our world. But let's think about greed and generosity in our context, that is, in so-called middle-class Melbourne. What would you like on your tombstone? Here lies a generous person. Or... Here lies a greedy person. You probably wouldn't put that on your tombstone. But, you know, by the end of your life, is my point, by the end of your life, which do you want to be known for? He was a really generous person. He was a really greedy person. So, greed and generosity from Proverbs. Let's start with greed, because that's what the writer does in chapter 1. But as I have on my outline, what, what's the allure of greed? Why is it attractive? I guess it's we think that getting this new thing will make us happy or getting this thing will make us more happy or getting this thing will give us more pleasure in our life or perhaps it's more subtle than that, subtle than that. Perhaps, perhaps getting this thing will help our friendships, perhaps our friends will be impressed if I have this thing or at least Maybe we'll keep up with the Joneses if we have this thing that they already have. One of the ways I see greed is where we 
all want kind of the next level up. You know, if we live in Ormond, we don't aspire to live in Turak, that's too far, but, but maybe Brighton? If we drive a Toyota, we don't aspire for a Rolls Royce, but maybe a BMW 3 Series. If we normally wear rod and gun, we don't go for Burberry, but maybe Polo, Polo Loren. If, if we normally holiday at Phillip Island, we, we aspire not perhaps for Tuscany, but, you know, Bar and Bay at least. That is, we always want the next level up from where we are. And the greed is subtle because we never want the top level. I never think, oh, yes, I really want a Rolls Royce. But we always want one level up from where we are. And, of course, it means that greed never makes us happy because there's always another level to go to. And actually, we see that greed built into our society over generations. We used to think that a basic chef stove, four burner gas stove, was good enough to cook our food. No, no, now we all want a smeg oven. We used to think that $100 was the most we would pay for a pair of jeans. You know, Levi 501s, they were the best. No, no, that's like the bottom level now. We want $400 designer ripped jeans. We used to think $1,000 was the most we'd pay for a television. You know, quality 26-inch colour television. No, no, now we spend $4,000 on a 75-inch television. We used to think that a white enamel fridge for about $800 was enough to keep our food cold. No, no, now we want a $3,500 four-door fridge with ice-making facilities and an internet connection. <laughs> it, it, but, but it's like it, isn't it? Greed, it, it? greed seems to be built into our capitalist society with, it, with its advertising, with, it, with its peer pressure. Proverbs chapter 1 said, My son, my child, if sinful people entice you, do not give in to them. Uh, like I said, sometimes it's other people that, that entice us to have more and more things. And, and things like Facebook and Instagram just make it worse because we see our friends' holiday or we see our friends' dinner at the restaurant and we think, Ooh, I'd like to have that. I'd, li I'd like to be there. And if there is an enticement for greed for other things, Proverbs shows how that swiftly leads to destruction. It's almost describing the youth crime problem we have at the moment. The enticement leads to stealing, verse 13. We'll get all sorts of valuable things. It even leads to gambling, verse 14. Cast lots with us, we'll full share the loot. Uh, by the way, this is, this is not a sermon about gambling per se, but the level of gambling in our society is testimony to the desperate greed that many people in our society find themselves entrapped in. And greed even leads to violence, verse 16, for their feet rushed into evil. They are swift to shed blood. Do you see, greed can lead to stealing, can lead to gambling, even lead to violence. And I'm describing what we see on our news almost every night of the week. But greed is a false idol because it quickly leads to one's own destruction. In Proverbs terms, he talks about it's like putting a net to catch, out to catch a bird, but the birds can all see the net, so it's pointless. Or as the writer ironically puts it, verse 18, these men lie in wait for their own blood. They ambush only themselves. And even greed leads to one's own demise before others. 1126, people curse the one who hoards grain. Jesus, Jesus, you might remember, shares a brilliant parable on the problem of greed. It goes like this. There's a rich man and he had so many crops that he did not have enough space in his barns to fill them. So he built even bigger barns, bigger and bigger barns. And finally he has enough for many years ahead, so he says to himself, ah, take life easy, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very knife, night your life will be demanded of you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? And here's Jesus' conclusion. This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself but is not rich towards God. 
Why is greed so insidious? Why is greed condemned? Well, as we heard from our Colossians series, effectively greed is idolatry. Greed means you so want, say, that new car that you spend lots of your time thinking about how great your life is going to be when you get this new car. And you think, spend all your time thinking about the new car rather than thinking about God. You replace God with the coming new car. And you spend all your time working extra so you've got enough money to buy this new car rather than serving God. And you spend all your time reading reviews of the car to make sure that you've bought the right thing rather than reading the scriptures. And your conversation with your friends is all about the new car that's coming rather than sharing the good news of Christ. And, you know, ironically, don't worry, I'm preaching to myself, ironically, you finally get this new car, you finally get this car, and about a week later, it's not so special anymore, it's just a car, it takes you from one place to the other, and then you have to start planning the next thing you want to buy. You see, greed is idolatry. What we do is we take the thing we want and it dominates our thinking so that God is pushed out and to one side. But let's turn to the opposite. Let's go positive. Let's talk about generosity. And in order to be generous, the first thing we need to do is to be able to listen. We hear that so often in Proverbs. Look again at 1.8. Listen to your father's instruction. Do not forsake your mother's teaching. And in, in, in a society like ours, where, where greed is like built into its structure, we will need good advice from our parents and good advice from our teachers and good advice, hopefully, from our preachers and good advice from our friends and good advice from our peers and colleagues. And we're going to need some accountability if we're going to be generous instead of greedy. But let me ask the question, why? Why should we be generous? Well, there are a number of answers throughout the scriptures. In Proverbs, firstly, interestingly, the first motivation to be generous is because generosity benefits you. Look at 11.24. One person gives freely, yet gains even more. Or verse 25. A generous person will prosper. It seems like the more you are generous, the more you'll gain. Paul says the same thing in 2 Corinthians 9. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will reap generously. Uh, Jesus puts it another way when Paul says that Jesus says in the book of Acts, it's more blessed to give than receive. It's more blessed to give than receive. Try it. It's actually more fun. It's more fun to give stuff away. It's more fun to give money away than to keep trying to hoard it for yourself. Be generous because it benefits you. Secondly, we should be generous because the reward we get from being generous means not so that we can have more stuff ourselves, but it means we can be even more generous to other people. That is, the reward of having more is not for ourselves, it's so we can give more. 2 Corinthians 9 puts it again like this. You will be made rich in every way. Why? So that you can be generous on every occasion. Thirdly, generosity praises God. 1917, slightly cryptic, whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord. Or again, 2 Corinthians 9, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. You know, praising God is not just about the words we say, like in the liturgy. Praising God is not just about the songs we sing. We praise God by how we live. And if we are generous, and we're generous people, that will overflow in praise to our God. Fourthly, generosity should be a defining characteristic of we as Christians. 1 John 3 puts it slightly starkly in the negative. If anyone, John says, if anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? You see, if we, if we have experienced the grace of God, 
If we know the love of God in Jesus Christ, that should overflow in our love for other people. And that love, again, is not a word, it's not a thought, it's love that is in deed and action in our being generous. Fifthly, like that, being generous shows who we are. You might remember Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If we are generous people, it shows that we have grasped something of the generosity of God. And sixthly, we should be generous because then we're being like Jesus, who, Philippians says, made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. Jesus gave up his all for us. We've just celebrated that in the Lord's Supper. We've taken bread and wine to remember he died for us. He gave up everything. That's how generous Jesus was. And our generosity is but a small response to what Jesus has done for us. Generosity benefits us. It helps us give even more. Generosity praises God. Generosity defines us as Christians. Generosity shows who we really are. And in the end, it helps us to be like Jesus. But if that's the why of generosity, what about the, the how of generosity? How should we be generous? Well, Paul has some advice for Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, where he says, you are to teach the rich not to hope in their wealth, but to trust in God. He says they are to do good, to be generous, to be willing to share, and to store up treasure in heaven. You might remember that Jesus, in another place, gives the challenging example of the poor widow who gave all she had to live on for that day. Remember, they're all coming past the temple tread, all coming past the collection plate, and all the rich people are chucking in all the things, but only out of their riches, so it's not really costing them anything. And here comes a poor widow who puts in all she had to live on, it says. I think that means all she had to live on for that day. She had nothing left, nothing to buy even bread with. I've actually had a go at doing that when, when other churches I've been part of have had fundraisers. I've thought, what did I actually make this day? And I estimate, what is the total amount of money I made this day? That is the amount I'm going to give to this project. It's one way to do it. I think generosity can be divided into various types of giving. Now, of course, we can give of our time. Of course, we can give of our talents as well as our money, but I'm going to keep our focus on money because I think that's where we find it difficult. And when you think about it, we can give to church, we can give to mission work, we can give to the poor, well, we can give to the government through our taxes, we can give to our family and our friends. And people will often give to their family and friends, and as such, we are forced to give money through our taxes to care for the poor and build roads and build hospitals. And Christians, we should pay our taxes. It's a good thing to pay tax. But so in the end, in my opinion, it is that Christians should first think about generosity in their giving to church and in their giving to mission, because no one else is going to do that. And obviously we have a great opportunity to be generous in this vicarage renovation appeal we're about to hear about in a moment. So how do we know when we're being generous? Uh, by the way, a little aside on tithing. You've probably heard of tithing, like giving away 10% of our income. That was an Old Testament principle. I don't think it's binding on us today. But having said that, it's pretty hard to argue that because we've received a greater salvation we should therefore give less than they gave in the Old Testament. <laughs> in fact, I love this story about a man who has a nightmare. And the man wakes up in the middle of the night and says to his wife, I've just had a terrible nightmare. The Lord took my weekly giving and multiplied it by 10 and that was my income. If we can go back to 2 Corinthians 9, I've got it on the bottom of the sheet, 2 Corinthians 9. Because Paul gives us clear instructions on how to give, on how to be generous. It says this, 
I think it's the key verse about giving. Faye talked about it recently. Each of you should give what you have decided to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. That is, you need to decide at home what you're going to give, not just rock up the church and go, oh, yeah, that'll do, we'll put that in. No, decide at home. If you've got a spouse, talk to your spouse about it. If you haven't got a spouse, if you're single, talk to a friend about it or someone in your home group about it. But be a decided giver. Make a decision about it. Again, giving is never to be forced. Giving is never to be forced. If you are unhappy to give, please don't give. Do you know you can give zero dollars to this church, zero dollars to the vicarage renovation, zero dollars to AFES or to CMS or anything like that, and you are still most welcome to come to this church. Of course, you can also transfer $10,000 lots if you like as well. That would be really helpful. And in the end, be a cheerful giver. Actually, the word cheerful there in the text is the word we get the word hilarious from. It's actually be a hilarious giver. But, you know, be a bit out there with your giving. You know, have a go at being generous. You know, splurge a bit on generosity. That's what it means. But let me finish with what I think is the great motivator for us to be generous. I've got it on the bottom of the sheet. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that through his poverty we might become rich. Amen.